We continue in our series um, on the Great Awakening, which I believe is happening, the fourth Great Awakening in this country, of, um, of religious change, that how, how we do ch- religion, how we think about it, how we practice it, is, is changing. What we are is not what we have been and what we will be. When we go through these times of transition, three questions arise, you know, and they can be placed in three different buckets. What do I think, which is the belief question? How should I act, which is the behavior question? And um, who am I, which is the belonging question? We've done the uh, who am I questions, and uh, now we begin the Um, How should I act? The behavior questions. How will behavior change in in the religion and and, and, and faith practices in the future? When we talk about how should I act, what should I do, our our questions usually revolve around do's and don'ts, uh, rights and wrongs, uh, rules and regulations, laws and moral code, duties, obligations, you know. Uh, when, we, when we look at life that way and in, in our religious uh, practices that way, do's and don'ts, uh, rights and wrongs, you know, there's, there's a right way to pray, there's a wrong way, there's a right way to take communion, there's a wrong way. Uh, it can become like that. And often religion, when it's, when it's do's and don'ts, we tend to see it mainly as don'ts, as prohibitions. You know, I was thinking about how I was reared, and it's the don'ts that stick in my mind, you know. You do not smoke, dance, cuss, or play cards and go to movies on Sunday. You know, you don't do those things. I know I was taught do's, I just don't remember them. And I wonder if that has to do with, you know, childhood development, if, if, if it's the if it's the don'ts that stick with us, those, they do. They're more imprinted in me than the do's. When we, when we look at it, religion as do's and don'ts, what should I do, how should I act, it tends to make God into a judge, the jury, maybe the executioner, a bully, makes God look very arbitrary. It just seems whimsical why God says do this, don't do that. Um, And it makes us feel guilty, shamed, joyless, fearful. Um, It makes us contractual. Uh, I hate to use this phrase because I know you've never heard this phrase. It makes our relationship with God a quid pro quo relationship. Um, you know, God does this, we do that. We don't do that, God does this. You know. So the question that the people ask of John the Baptist, what should we do, you know, is a common religious question. John's talking about the kingdom of God coming and The axe is laid to the root of the tree. It's kind of fearful. What should we do? How do I escape the coming wrath? Well, John says, let those who have two coats give one to the poor. Let those who have more food share that with the hungry. Well, that's, that's good advice. I mean, most of our closets and most of our cupboards are too full. Share what we have with those who don't. Goes on to say to the tax collector, do not extort. Don't take more than is merited. Don't be a taker. 
We have problems with takers, those who never reciprocate, those who never give. Don't be a taker. He goes on to say to the soldier, don't use coercion. Don't falsely accuse others. Don't be a bully. Don't push people around. Don't lie. Don't bear off false witness. That's good advice. Those are good do's. How should I act? How should I? How should we take communion? How should we pray? How should we hold our hands? How should we, what should our posture be? How should we baptize? And one can have bitter arguments about what's right and wrong and accuse people of not having faith because they don't do it the right way. And people can get excluded and shunned for very simple stuff. The how and the what questions were the big ones when I was growing up, and they probably were big for you too. What do we do? How do we do it? I don't know what age I was when we had our first fight in the car when we were driving to church as a family. I'm going to say my sister provoked it. Um, why do we have to go to church? Why do we have to dress up? Why do we have to go to Sunday school? Why do we have to sing those songs? Why do we sit where we do? Those why questions. Usually, you know, they're annoying. And if you're a parent, don't think you're going to avoid those. And the answers were usually unsatisfactory. Why go to church so you don't go to hell? So you go to heaven? You do it because it's in the Bible. And then the classic, we've always done that. That why question is so annoying, it's so messy, and it can be so divisive. We think everything is settled, and then somebody asks, well, why are we doing this? And often we, we get mad because we don't know why we're doing it. We've lost the reason. You know, we, we have practices in our families and in our lives where at some point we do say, why, why are we doing this every Saturday? Why, why do we fold the clothes this way? Why, why do I go to this job? I, I've lost the reason for it. I'm burned out. Why do I go to this church? I've lost the reason. Yeah. It's a tough question. I like it in the, you know, in the Old Testament, where in Deuteronomy, you know, parents are enjoined to say to their children when they're walking and then they're rising and, you know, explain the faith to them. The Lord our God is one God, and we shall love the Lord our God with one heart and one mind and one soul. And explain that to your children, the Bible says. And at Passover, you know, there are the four ritual questions. Why is this night different than all other nights? Why is an important question why is the difference 
between being just religious and being spiritual and religious. I mean, often we hear, you know, I'm spiritual but not religious. Why is the difference? Knowing the why is the difference. Why is the difference between a mature faith and an immature faith? Why is the difference between having a second-hand faith from my parents and just reflecting their faith and having my own faith that I can say, this is what I believe. Yeah. To know that why is very important. It's important because the unexamined life is not worth living. If we don't know why we do something, you know, we're just kind of a pawn and easily pushed around. The examined life that knows why it's doing something is worth living. To ask that why question strengthens and refines our faith. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Do I really believe that? The last part of why, don't think the sermon's over because I said last. Why is important because in a world that's becoming more and more morally ambiguous, where we don't know why, we should welcome those at our borders where we don't know why we should include the marginalized. To be able to say why is very important when we need more moral and ethical direction. Why? Why? Well, why do we do what we do religiously? The usual response is, it's a response to God. In the Ten Commandments, you know, we know the Ten Commandments, or at least we know 60% of them is what surveys say. It's not arbitrary from God. It be, the Ten Commandments begin with the statement, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of slavery in Egypt to a new land of freedom. So we do the Ten Commandments because God freed us from slavery. And that is something of a quid pro quo. God did this, we do that. In the first John reading, we love because God first loved us. It's again that quid pro quo. Why do I love? Because God loves me. But there's more to it than that. The notion is that we love because it gives life. Loving is what makes us alive and human, fully human. Last week I talked about, um, I think, therefore I am. Also ended by saying, we are, therefore I am. That we are, that one exists in community. Well, this is, I love, therefore I am. The implication is that love leads to life. We usually get it reversed, that life leads to love. But biblically, loving leads to life. 
So it's not really a quid pro quo. It's more existential than that. God's telling us to love because that's how we live and become fully human. You know, Paul says that. If I speak in the tongue... In, human tongues or the tongues of angels but have not love I'm nothing I'm nothing we love in order to live Anne Lamott says that when one loves it's like putting a straw in the ocean and if that straw is aligned with the current, the whole ocean can pass through that law, straw. But if it's perpendicular to the ocean, nothing goes through it. When one is aligned with God and loving, all of God can go through that person. But when one is not loving, nothing of God can go through that person. And John says, we love so that God can be in us and God can surround us and God can flow through us and be perfected in us. We become fully human. So it used to be, what should we do and how do we do it? And then maybe we got to the why. But in the fourth great awakening, it's what should we do? Why should we do it? And then, how do we do it? We sometimes talk of religious practices, and Wesley, Wesley talks of religious practices, you know, the means of grace, whereby when we practice these means, we come to experience God. Corporate worship, scripture reading, prayer, fasting, small groups, communion. He talks about works of mercy, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick. These are practices and when I think about practicing religion, I'm not sure it's best to try to do all of that. I think it's best to do the one practice that makes us feel alive, that makes us feel purposeful, that makes us feel like we have meaning and significance in our life, the one practice that brings us closer to God. For some people, it's the practice of prayer. Prayer is what they do, and they do it because it brings them closer to God. And how they do it is up to them to figure out. You know. Reading Scripture is what they do. Why they do it is because it brings them into God's presence. How they do it, when they do it, it's up to them. I was talking to a person after morning blend, and he said, you know, I've, I've started the, a religious practice of not walking by homeless people on the street. I stop and talk to them. He said, nobody ever talks to them. And he said, I've made that a practice to talk to them. And he said, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to experience God through them. That's his religious practice. His face just lit up when he talked about that. This, this summer, I, got a, I started to think about what I would teach in the fall, what Bible course I would teach in the fall. And I was talking with a church member, and the church member said, you know, I'm not sure we need another Bible course. He said, what I think we need is to be quiet and just to sit in the presence of God. We never do that. We're too busy. And he said, I would love a time where I could sit in the presence of God in the quiet of the church 
and just be. And I thought, I would too. I would like that too. That's why we're going to start that midweek Wednesday service this week. It's an opportunity to just be, to carve out a half hour just to be in the presence of God. Of course we could do that at home, but we don't. Just to pray and be silent and meditate on God's love for a half hour. It's what we do, why we do it, is to know that we are in God's hands. How we do it, I did research on that, but that wasn't the important question. The question was, why would we do it? In the Great Awakening, I believe that the what question will be important, but the what we do will be changing. Our religious practices will be changing. Some will, be, will die out. There will be new ones. How we do things will be changing. We are so influenced by other religions and other cultures. How we go about certain religious practices will be influenced by Islam, by, by Buddhism, by Hinduism, by Judaism. It already is. And the last question, and to me the least important question in the Great Awakening is, how? But we will know why. It's to be in the presence of God and to let God flow through us. May it be so. Amen.